want to give a warm welcome to everyone to the closing session of day three of the Jobs Recent Summit. I'm Laura Tyson. I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. More importantly, I've worked for a long time with the World Economic Forum, with Sadia and other leaders of the forum for many years on this and other topics. And I'm honored to bring us all together to moderate this closing session of day three. I want to point out this is about education, skills, and lifelong learning. The other sessions are about economic growth, about good jobs and wages, and about equity, inclusion, and social justice. Skills, retraining, education are essential to realizing all of those other goals. It's like the key to economic growth. It's the key to good jobs. It's the key to equity, inclusion, and social justice. So this is a very important day. And what we really want to focus on here is uh, from a very distinguished panel, the priorities they see in the education and skill and upskilling and reskilling areas and what actions they are taking in their own organizations to achieve uh, goals of improving and extending education, extending skills, extending training. And it's not only for current workers, but also for workers of the future. So uh, that's uh, to motivate the conversation. And uh, we have a very distinguished panel. And the hardest thing for the moderator here is to keep to the time, because everyone here has essentially three to four minutes to summarize their sense of priorities and actions. So our panel uh, includes uh, Minister al Moyad. He's the Minister of Youth and Sports Affairs in Bahrain. John Goodwin, who is the CEO of Lego Foundations in Denmark. Salil Parikh, who's the CEO and Managing Director of Infosys and a Summit Co-Chair. Henrietta Floor, Executive Director of UNICEF and also a Summit Co-Chair. And Sebastian Trun, President and Executive Chairman of Udacity. I want to address the same set of questions to all of the panelists. What do you think is the highest priority in the education skills and lifelong learning area? And what actions are you planning to take within your organization to achieve, to act on these priorities and achieve success? And I think I'll start with the summit co-chairs. So Salil, uh, again, a CEO and Managing Director of Infosys. Uh, can you talk to us about your sense of priorities and actions? Uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you, uh to the World Economic Forum and Sadia for having me here. Uh, it's been actually a thrilling uh, set of activities in another session earlier today. Uh, we can see a lot of progress, a lot of action-oriented thinking. Uh, in terms of the priorities, there are really two that stand out. The first is a focus on looking at the labor pool, which is based on skills, in addition to being based on degrees. And this really takes a completely different perspective on how labor is looked at, how employees are looked at, and what and who comes in uh, to the employee pool. And the second is the leverage of technology for the purpose of education and learning and skilling and reskilling. Uh, today, mm -hmm. technology is allowing us to better distribute, create more compact content and also change completely the way access is available for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of actions, uh, we, we want to really emphasize more and more uh, bringing in different people from adjacent labor pools, reskilling them, and bringing in them into the workforce within the organization. Uh, and second, a, a real continuous focus on reskilling through tools which are available anywhere, anytime for all of our employees. So those really are some of the priorities and the actions. Uh, and back over to you, Laura. Can I ask one follow-up? And I probably will do this for each speaker. Um, do, do you have a sense that you know what skills need to be uh, trained in? So there's the issue of delivery. There's the issue of training versus education. What about the content? What, 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 what skills are you looking to train in that you think is mo that are most important? So today, of course, the digital skills are critical, but there's also an increased need in what we consider the softer skills, much more focused on liberal arts educations, much more focused on emotional intelligence. 
And we find that in navigating the world, even in this new technology enabled era, it's very critical to have those sorts of skills, to have empathy as we interact with people. And especially in this environment, when we foresee that in the post medical crisis environment as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me turn on to Henrietta and Henrietta, uh, UNICEF, so that your focus may be on uh, education of younger people. Uh, but let me ask you, and I heard a very disturbing statistic yesterday, which I hope is not true, that 90% of the world's uh, children right now are not in traditional school because of COVID. I, I don't know if that's true, but Henrietta, priorities, actions. Thank you, Laura. Yes, yeah, so uh, UNICEF does look after children and young people, and they have a big request to all of us who are older. And it is, please give us a modern education and get us ready to have some sort of a job or to make our own jobs, because we're not sure what the future uh, will bring to us. But we really need help. So um, there's a white paper that's just out. It's called Save Our Future White Paper. It's a global coalition, and it's talking about how to work with children and young people and rebuild education systems. So everyone take a look at that. And what we are after is ending the um, learning crisis and the skills crisis. So there are a couple of parts to it. The first is that we really want to connect every school in the world to the internet. And this would mean connecting teachers and families and learners to the internet, whether a child is in school or young person is in school or whether they're out of school. We think with the new technologies that we can do it now. This is a a once in a generation opportunity for the world. So number one is connect. Number two is make sure that then there is very good quality education that's available for teachers because many of them are going to have to learn these skills, um, but also that young people can direct their own education. They're interested in learning about what they see as an opportunity in their own environment locally. So they, they know what skills they'd like and they're dreaming about their futures. And so it's self-empowering education with excellent quality. And to Salil's point, they're gonna need empathy, they're gonna need entrepreneurship, they're gonna need everything. Mm, right. okay. The third area is um, we really can use companies that are telecom companies to allow for zero rating of education materials. So you can download education materials for free. So it's affordable everywhere. The next area we need are devices. Not everyone has devices that are connecting to the internet. So we need tablets and cell phones, and everything else all over the world. And lastly, young people really want to help other young people. So if you're digitally savvy, you want to help other young people become digitally savvy. If you know how to install solar panels um, or be an electrician, you want to help others. So apprenticeships, mentorships of older people to younger people will be very much part of the reskilling revolution and the reset that we see ahead. So, so Henrietta, okay. on this, I, my follow-up question would be very brief, and it's, uh, I think that's a, a very important, amazing vision. Um, I will only say the issue is going to be, uh, as for many of these things, funding it. How do you fund that building out of broadband to everyone? How do you provide equipment to everyone? Uh, governments are uh, basically hard-pressed by other priorities. So very important to think about the budgetary how we're going to handle the budgetary part of this, Henrietta. Um, Laura, absolutely. You're on to a key issue. So <laughs> right. um, that we, in the health sector, as a world, we created uh, Gavi for vaccines so that there were common okay. bids. Mm -hmm. UNICEF does that now. We buy half the vaccines in the world and we do it with common bids. So for mm -hmm. internet connection, we think we can have common bids for geographies in the world. So uh, the Southern part of the African continent, the Caribbean islands, they can be in a common um, lower satellite and we can connect them. So it's doable. We've priced it. We're working with the World Bank, loans, oh, wonderful. grants. We can do this, Laura. Oh, well, thank you. That's, that's really great news. And uh, 
uh, it's wonderful to share with the audience. We'll, we'll all mobilize to make sure it gets done. All right, let me turn uh, next to uh, John Goodwin. He's the CEO of Lego Foundation. John. Hi, Laura, thanks very much. Um, to address your question in terms of the highest priority, mm -hmm. uh, we believe that we really have to reinvent education. Even prior to the global pandemic, it was estimated that by 2030, half of the world's children and young people were not going to have the skills and qualifications they'd need to participate in the emerging global workforce. And we believe that it's very important if you think about education as a house, an individual's uh, education house, you need to build it on solid foundations. So that means that you have to start early and equip children with those skills that they will need uh, in ladder into in the later life. So we mm -hmm. believe that quality early childhood development and primary mm -hmm. education is essential to provide those foundation capabilities that will enable them to reskill uh, and continually be agile in the future. Specifically, what we're doing in order to enable that is we are thinking about parents, educating parents and equipping them with the capabilities they need to help young children on their early journey. So, for example, we have been providing 440,000 uh, special packs for refugee children and their families to enable them to continue their learning journey even through the global pandemic. We're also working and investing in teachers to equip them in the pedagogical capabilities that they will need in order to help the children thrive with these skills, to break away from the historical approach of knowledge transfer and instead look at real skill development. So we've developed distance learning guides that help teachers in all environments, low tech and high tech, uh, to help facilitate children developing their skills. We've also developed uh, a massive online open course uh, to educate teachers all around the world on how to develop social and emotional skills uh, for their children and build resilience. And then finally, we're working with governments, South Africa, Mexico, Ukraine, Colombia, Ghana, to name a few, to rethink about their early childhood and primary education systems and how they can really develop the whole structures to help children develop those holistic skills for the future. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I, I think it's very important that you brought in early childhood education because we tend to think of this as, you know, starting at some K, kindergarten or the first year of school and so much of evidence, as you know, really the ability to learn and to move forward in skills rests in early childhood education and very early childhood education. So that's a very important uh, area. And uh, we appreciate the, the work of uh, the Lego Foundation and the, and the vision of the Lego Foundation. Let me turn now to um, Sebastian, um, uh, Udacity, uh, and hear about the, that's really more on the skill side, uh, on the current workers and the future workers. Uh, uh, so over to you, Sebastian. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, World Economic Forum, for this opportunity and for running this event. Um, in the last 10 years, Udacity has become the market leader for digital upskilling and digital transformation in the world. We do this worldwide with many corporations, many governments with the goal of really supporting lifelong learning through the entire mm -hmm. journey of your life. We want you to be mm -hmm. at the bleeding edge skill set. To get there, uh, what we've done is we've used technology. We uh, do all our education online and that gives us immediately uh, global reach to get the right skill sets, we actually looked not to universities, we looked to industry, to tech giants like Amazon and Facebook and Google, because mm -hmm. those companies are at the bleeding edge of what's possible today. And to be able to play along with those companies in the world, you ought to know what they know. So our instructors come from those companies. And finally, thanks to the internet, we've explored very advanced voodoo style pedagogy where you don't just listen to a professor and hear about technology, mm -hmm. but we use projects and project work as the core mm -hmm. of our education 
So you get to experience it yourself. There's a saying, if you catch a person the fish, the person has dinner for one night. But we believe if we teach a person how to fish, the person has dinner for the rest of their lives. Just to give you one example, in our work with the government of Egypt, Egypt learned the, uh, launched the Egypt Forward program, directly supported by President LCC and the minister of the ICT, Dr. Amar Talat. It's a free program that targets 100,000 Egyptians and the goals of the next 24 months to double Egypt's annual earnings from online freelancing. You might not think of Egypt as a freelancing behemoth and country, but that's where Egypt wants to be and will be. So Udacity provides three things. It provides training. It helps people to improve their individual livelihoods. And it provides a big benefit to the economy of Egypt by turning Egypt into a technology hub. So far, uh, we started in June, we have already 8,000 graduates. Mm -hmm. And at this point, 40,000 Egyptians are enrolled in Udacity and non programs, learning how to become technical people. As an example, Catherine Keir, a young Egyptian woman, has become, through us, a data scientist. And 30 days after graduation of our program, she earned a new job in making 10,000 US dollars per month. That in Egypt is a lot of money. The Egypt Forward program is a case study how government can accelerate digital transformation that's focused on ROI and outcomes for citizens. And I believe that's the new normal. The new normal is that all of us, myself included, have to continue in lifelong learning, lifelong education. Technology is moving faster than ever before and we live longer than ever before, we need ways to transform education from a one-time thing into a lifelong activity. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm gonna just raise a question for all of us to think about. I, we may not have time to address it, but the focus of this is very much on, it is on skills, education, training. That's creating a educated, skilled workforce. The question is, what will be the jobs available to them. That's a demand side problem. That is a, where are the sectors going to grow? What skills do we need? And also related a little bit to the underlying technology here. And again, I don't think we can answer this question, but it's good to pose it. Uh, there is a concern that the digital technology itself and the automation technology itself is really uh, leading to both some upskilling, but also some downskilling and also to some elimination or disappearance of jobs. And so just, I, I don't, we can't solve that problem here, but I think all of us need to think about it. So Sebastian or Salil, you are working on skills. You know the jobs you're training for. You know the jobs you're training for. Um, and that strikes me as a very important part of the puzzle here is yet when you train, you're training for where you think there are real opportunities for employment. Um, let me turn to uh, Minister Al Moyad of Youth and Sports Affairs in Bahrain to talk about what Bahrain is doing uh, in this area. Priorities and actions, Minister, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the World Economic Forum for giving, this, uh, giving us this opportunity to present what we're doing. And thank you to the panelists uh, for, for being here and participating. It's a very distinguished panel, and I'm proud to be here. Um, with regards to the Kingdom of Bahrain, um, I have to say that, that um, there's a lot happening on the ground. Um, and, and thanks to all the work that we're doing with the World Economic Forum, and I'll set that out in a second. Um, we, we're, we're seeing changes and leaps and bounds. But this goes, maybe, Laura, back to, to what you were saying. To be very honest, this uh, time um, was very important for us. The last year has been very important for us. Uh, we were able to take that time to diagnose the huge disconnect uh, between mm -hmm. education, academia, and the, the, the demand that we see. So like, like you correctly identified, we do have a demand side problem. We also have a supply side problem. Um, and what we've seen, to be honest, the, uh, over a, a quick analysis of the segment um, is that we, we were working with a lot of legacy processes, a lot of legacy operations um, that, that simply 
didn't cater to uh, the, the current demands uh, of, of the sector, of the industry, uh, of the world, to be, to be honest. Um, and so what we did was we're very proud to have, and we're very lucky, to be honest, to have leadership here in the kingdom that, that's willing to completely rethink the system, that's willing to think outside the box and, and think in, in long term, and is willing to, to take huge shifts uh, that are unprecedented. So, so if I might uh, just maybe outline a few things that we're doing that might be relevant uh, to this sure. discussion. Um, first and foremost, as far as KPIs, yes, we have KPIs with regards to skills and upskilling. Uh, that's a huge part of the system. But we also have KPIs with regards to more softer uh, elements. We need our labor force uh, to be transient. We need our labor force to be flexible. We need our national qualification framework uh, to, to be both as well. Um, to allow people to jump into and out of professions, um, that in our legacy system didn't, uh, th that simply wasn't, wasn't practical. Um, our KPIs included much softer elements where we wanted our labor force and our youth in particular to feel safe, seen, supported, wanted, trusted. Uh, we wanted them to feel hopeful. And, and to do that, um, Upskilling them and reskilling them is a huge element uh, there. So when, once we give them the opportunity, we give them the landscape, we show the landscape, maybe shed light on the landscape, um, that would allow us just to, to instill that, that, uh, that, that drive to, to pull knowledge uh, and also then allocate that knowledge um, into specific industries. And so this, this, everything that we've done in the Kingdom of Bahrain has, has come in hand in hand through collaboration with the private sector collaboration with international institutions like the World uh, Economic Forum. Um, and what we did was, just so that it's, it's, it's not so philosophical, um, what we did was we put a task force uh, in the kingdom. We've got 11 ministers. Uh, this is, this is a, a first, at least for the kingdom of Bahrain, where we've got 11 ministers working on the same problem, collaborating, uh, coordinating, oh. to make sure that we shift the system completely. We're, we're addressing and reverse engineering the needs of industry, the needs of the market, the needs of, of companies, um, and also trying to, to, to change our role from operators, providers of, of education, as far as the public sector is concerned, to facilitators. We're facilitating when it comes to regulations and we're facilitating when it comes to, to funding. So we're really jumping from a, from a push sort of system where we're, 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 we're pushing uh, academia uh, they, they down on the, the students, the recipients, uh, the beneficiaries of the system to a pure pull uh, system. And so I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic to hear what Udacity was talking about, what Lego was talking about, because everything mm -hmm. that everyone here was talking about, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge mind shift. Right, they, they, where, mm -hmm. where what yes. we want is our, we want our youth to, to have the opportunity to pull this sort of information and it's our job to facilitate. And so I've, I've never heard any other government speaking like this, to be honest. Uh, I'm sure there are some, uh, but we're very, very proud of what we're doing in Bahrain. Now at the heart of what we're doing, we're calling it the tertiary action plan. Uh, it's, it's across the, 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 the whole spectrum of education um, and, it, and uh, across all touch points. At the heart of it, um, is the upskilling and reskilling revolution. Um, we, we're, we're taking very close attention to, to what the likes of Udacity, what the likes of Lego, what the likes of even Khan Academy, what Google is doing with their, with their four month uh, courses uh, that are at par, I believe, with bachelor degrees. And then we're also looking at Duolingo and how they're, they're, they're gamifying things uh, and, then, and then providing a, a quick instantaneous testing uh, framework. And so to do that, we needed to collaborate with, work with best in class and to figure out, take a quick look around and see what the rest of the world is doing. And, and nothing to be honest, gave us that more or better or faster than our work with the World Economic Forum. So, so a big thank you That's to the right. World Economic Forum. Um, what we've done is we've put a, a new system at the heart of this, this new revolution, educational revolution. Um, and we've created, based on the, the, the advice of, recommendation of, and support of the World Economic Forum, um, the, the Closing the Skills Gap Accelerator, uh, which I'm, I'm honored to, to champion, and I'm public chair, public sector chair, excuse me, uh, for. We've, we've also got private sector chairs, so we're collaborating with the private sector. And so what this has done is this helps us identify the missing skill sets, 
identify the easiest way. So not only the missing skill set, because in, in our legacy system, you would identify the missing skill set. And then we top down would try to create a system and then push it downwards. And that simply just doesn't work. And so what we're doing instead is we're, we're developing with the team an education, employability, excuse me, an employability skills portal. Now, what that does is that tells us in, in numerical data-based decision-making um, what the jobs are paying, what's available, um, what the demand is in the segment, in, in the sector, um, who is available uh, in the market. And so when we're talking to institutions, uh, they, they like, like our panelists here, um, they, when we're speaking to them and asking them to come to Bahrain, to work with us in Bahrain, we can show them the numbers. Um, and, and this is being rolled out and is due to be launched at the end of the year, so end of December. So we've got an education, employee, excuse me, an employability skills portal that gives us the data to know what we're working with. We've got this mm -hmm. huge shift that we're doing in, in state of mind, where we're going from operator to facilitator, um, which mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned is, is absolutely brilliant. They, what we've also done uh, which is relevant uh, to this is we've looked re-looked at our funding formula and so what we're doing now is we're ignoring old legacy funding model and what we're our funding now is much more performance based even when it comes to education we're happy to fund universities support uh, with research and so on but we need this research as far as we're concerned we're on borrowed time so because we're on borrowed so time for these youth <laughs> then we want it to be very very relevant they, they, so, they, Minister, they, I, really I need to, uh, I think we're almost out of time here, I can see from the numbers. Uh, I want to say it's a, it's a fascinating and detailed presentation with some, and what I'm struck by this panel is the ways that people can work together. That basically there are things, I, bringing all of the activities of all of these organizations and leaders together uh, to solve uh, problems is very, very exciting and inspiring. And everyone has been very clear about the priorities and actions, which I thank you for. And I thank you, Minister, at the end for bringing us back to the World Economic Forum and the importance of the forum in creating this kind of collaboration and action. And so I can now turn it over to uh, Sadia Zahidi for a couple of closing remarks uh, for our discussion. Thank you all so very much. And thank you all so very much for what you're doing. It's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely essential to economic growth and to economic inclusion and to good jobs and to a sound future. Laura, so Sadia, over to you. Laura, thank you very much. Um, absolutely essential and also absolutely inspiring. I think uh, when we were starting out this day, we were thinking um, that the the, the pre-pandemic emergencies that already existed when it comes to education and reskilling are not only existent today, but are also even more of a crisis level than they were before. And so how are we going to get to some of those solutions? And I think the examples that you've heard today lay out how quickly so many programs and activities have been able to pivot to start delivering, even in the midst of a health crisis, the solutions that are required. Um, we heard a lot of great outcomes today. I'm just going to try to summarize three types of them. The first is we heard a lot of new insights. So there is, of course, the World Economic Forum's own Future of Jobs report that has a lot on skills. Please do take a look. But in addition to that, the Education Commission Save Our Future report that Henrietta referred to. And in addition to that, the OECD has started producing a human-centric assessment related to PISA. Now, that is a very famous framework. And what they're trying to do is now apply that to softer skills. The second type of... Um, outcome is very related to types of actions that are being taken forward and uh, Udacity is amongst others that is helping create a skills consortium and a common language or a common taxonomy around skills so more to come on that front as well um, the closing the skills gap accelerators that the minister has already described uh, Bahrain is amongst uh, 10 countries now that is taking this type of initiative forward and certainly the kind of advancement that we're seeing in Bahrain we want that to be shared across a learning network of other countries I'm delighted to announce that we have now 
Turkey as one of the Closing the Skills Gap accelerators, second, Georgia, and third, Greece, that have all announced this week at the Jobs Reset Summit that they will all be taking a similar model forward. In addition to that, accelerators that already existed in Brazil have made massive new strides. Accelerators in Pakistan have made massive new strides, as well as that in India. So there has been a lot of progress. And again, even in the midst of the emergency that has been faced by so many economies in the last nine months. And then finally, if you would like to follow any of this, please go to reskillingrevolution2030.org, where a number of the initiatives that we've heard about, not just from the countries, but also from organizations such as LEGO, such as Infosys, and as such as UNICEF can also be followed along. So thank you very much, Laura. Thank you to all of the panelists. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the final day of the Jobs Reset Summit focused on equity, inclusion, and social justice.